and welcome to the CSPC 2023 pre-conference Zoom sessions. This one entitled Fundamentals in Science Communication and Education. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the Director of Communications and Public Engagement here at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo. Before we uh, introduce our panelists, I want to start with an acknowledgement. Perimeter is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples and is located on the Haldeman Tract, a tract granted by the British to the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We're thankful to those who have preceded us. We're committed to act responsibly and collaboratively to carry forward the quest for knowledge uh, for the betterment of all. Thank you to everyone uh, who has tuned in today. We're absolutely delighted to spend the next uh, 90 minutes with you. Let's welcome in our uh, subject matter experts today. Joining us here in the Mike Lazarus Theater of Ideas at Perimeter are Dr. Emily Petroff, Associate Director, Associate uh, Partnerships, uh, Grants and Awards. And uh, Emily spends a lot of time thinking about science communication. And we also have Dr. Damian Pope, one of our outstanding research scientists. He spends a lot of his time on uh, science education. So Damian and Emily, thank you. Uh, I know you're excited to share some points of view. As we get started, a few notes uh, for our audience. Please quickly complete the poll that we have live now. It'll give, give us a bit of a sense of who's tuned in today. If you could also please remember to fill out the demographic poll and pre-conference survey. Those questions will pop up during the session quite quickly. And uh, also, if you could use the Q&A feature to send in questions, we're going to do our best to kind of get to some of those questions as we uh, proceed. And we'll, of course, reserve time at the end uh, for questions that come in. So is it possible, uh, Josh, to have the poll results put up on the screen? Okay, so it looks like we've got uh, quite a few policymakers in. We've got some educators, we've got some scientists, some administrators, private industry folks. We've got a pretty balanced uh, audience. Uh, so, uh, Damien and Emily, let's let's get into it. We we believe here that science communication is more important than ever as kind of big new technologies emerge. They have the potential to transform society. On the other hand, it's an evolving topic. It can be a bit of a moving target. It's certainly not one size fits all. The audience can be different. Each of you have experience and expertise communicating to different audiences. So we're going to cover a few territories today. Uh, they span our topics. We'll start with critical thinking. We want to spend some time on quantum and on AI. They're topical and, uh, of course, near and dear to us here at, at Perimeter. We're going to spend some time on communication, education, meeting people where they are, and uh, finishing up with a bit of a view to the future and some challenges that may come. I want to make sure we talk about your experiences in science communication, your vision for how we keep this uh, as a topic uh, and and at the fore of uh, the conversation in today's society. So perhaps we could we could start with a little bit of background and context from each of you. A Emily, could you start, please? Sure. Yeah, it's great to be here. So uh, my name is Emily Petroff. I'm the Associate Director for Strategic Partnerships, Grants and Awards here at Perimeter. Uh, this is a super interesting topic to me. My background is in physics, in astrophysics. I have a PhD in astrophysics, did a couple of postdocs. Mm. My research was specifically focused on this topic called fast radio bursts. And uh, as part of my PhD and into my postdocs, this this topic that I was working on really um, really captivated the public. It was it was this big mystery. It still is a big mystery, which is super fun. Um, but because it was this brand new big mystery in astrophysics, um, it got a lot of media attention. There was a lot of interest from the public. There were a lot of news articles, et cetera. And I found myself uh, interacting with the media as a scientist uh, around my research and around sort of dispelling rumors around what these things were and weren't. They were not aliens, you know, that came up a lot. But I started interacting with with journalists, with the public, uh, getting really active on Twitter, um, really just trying to talk to people about the science, what it meant, what it, why it was important, why it could be interesting for them. And I thought that that was a really interesting experience. I, I, I thought that um, I got to see a lot of different viewpoints into like why science is important and how to captivate an audience with science communication. Um, and then after I left academia, working for big Canadian projects like the Chime Telescope, which is just doing incredible things and makes it into the news a lot and, you know, communicating why investments in things like Chime are important and, you know, big in infrastructure investments in science. Mm. Um, and then now at Perimeter, 
my role is mainly focused on speaking to government stakeholders, funders, policymakers, partners um, about why keeping that sort of vision of fundamental science alive is so critical to society. And, um, you know, that that specific lens that, I, that I'm bringing at Perimeter is really how to talk to government about it. But I think um, my background talking to people about my own research really taught me a lot in terms of how to make that message accessible, how to make it, um, uh, you know, within reach to people, make it tangible, even if you're talking about something extremely abstract. Um, and so at Perimeter, that's a lot of what I do is really, you know, take something as abstract and uh, challenging as theoretical physics and really try to bring it home to people about, you know, why is this something that's important for Canada? Okay, great. So many themes there that we'll, we'll end up coming back to. Uh, Damien, could you give us a little bit of background on yourself? Yeah, I'm also a, a researcher. I have a PhD in physics, and uh, I'm Damien Pope. I work in Perimeter's outreach, um, well, outreach and um, Department of Training, Educational Outreach, and Scientific Programming. Um, my area of research is quantum physics. I did a PhD in that. So that's really just kind of the physics of um, atoms, electrons, these basic building blocks that, as far as we know, make up everything in the universe, um, kind of on the theoretical side. And I was always really interested in kind of the fundamental, almost philosophical aspects of that. But it turns out that a lot of people took that basic research and actually um, used it to kind of build really innovative new technologies, quantum computers being perhaps the biggest example. And so I kind of got interested in this sort of area of uh, quantum technologies, um, did a postdoc after that. Um, and along the way, I guess I really got interested in, in teaching. And so I got interested more in science outreach and science education. Um, and so really, I see myself as a science translator. I kind of really I love the idea of taking these sort of abstract, um, very, very kind of perhaps distant ideas in quantum physics or black holes or anything, and trying to sort of package them up in a way that's engaging to people, but also is is accurate and, and kind of authentic to the science. And so that's a lot of what my day-to-day -day job involves now. Um, essentially just uh, trying to communicate, trying to translate to students, teachers, and the general public. And one thing I'm just really sort of fascinated by is almost the, the psychology of it. And I mean, I'm biased, I kind of love quantum, but just talking to people going out there on the street, it's something that is so far removed from people's daily lives and people's experience. I love just the challenge of, of almost trying to bridge that gap because more and more it's 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 becoming sort of relevant as we develop new technologies based on that. So that's excellent. One of the things I'm really excited about today is obviously tremendous expertise, uh, academic training and rigor here, but you're also very current on the subject matter, like extremely current. And so we can get to the kind of the very latest thinking and, and best practices as, as we go through things. Um, you, you know, you raised uh, kind of quantum and AI already. I know we're, we're going to be excited to get into that. I'm sure the audience is going to be excited to get it, but we're going to make them wait. Uh, we're going to do our job and we're going to build a bit of a foundation for the conversation. And I, I thought we'd start with kind of the, the kind of base idea of critical thinking. So why should we be teaching critical thinking as a part of science education? Yeah. Um, for me, where it comes from is often I hear every now and again, it pops up that people say students should be learning the latest programming language or the latest technology or the latest software, um, really kind of specific te technological content. And that's that's very important. But of course, the world is changing. And so what you may teach a student today that's not going to be current. That's not going to be the latest thing one year, two years, three years from now. Uh, the pace of change is just increasing. Mm. So my personal opinion is just as valuable as teaching people specific content. It's teaching these broad foundational skills. So how to think, critical thinking, e even how to learn. Um, and these are things that I think people don't necessarily, you know, we're not born with knowing them. Something that can be caught, taught and needs to be taught. But when people have that, that's just to me like a really strong foundation for a house that whatever comes along, 
people are able to sort through things, they're able to learn new technologies, um, they're able to see what they should focus on, what they shouldn't focus on with you know this bombardment of information we have coming at us today. So however how the world changes, I think change being the only constant, they're just really good skills, I feel, to have them in the toolkit. And so I think at Perimeter and Outreach, We've had that from day one. Many, many other outreach groups have had them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so recently we created a resource on the nature of science. And one of the activities in that is really having students identify quite common thinking fallacies that all of us human beings have to be more aware of them and to have perhaps not kind of slip into them so much. And so I think, especially for young people, just really kind of starting out in their careers, um, I feel they're kind of super valuable because we we can't predict the future. Emily, you're you're nodding. Yeah. I... <laughs> when it comes to science comms, how, how does critical thinking fit in? Yeah, I mean, I think everything that Damien said is so spot on. I mean, um, I see critical thinking as not just a science skill, right? Um, you know, we go and we speak to policymakers, we speak to legislators, uh, and, you know, we hear like it that it's so important for people to learn critical thinking. They find it's a tool that they use in their own decision making, right? Everybody uses, everybody who has to be making decisions uses critical thinking. And so I see it as critical thinking skills serve you in life. It's something that comes along for the ride as you learn about science, because science is, I think, one of the purest ways to teach critical thinking. It's so um, methodical in terms of here is a problem. Here is a hypothesis about how to solve this problem. Here are some approaches to uh, answering the question in my hypothesis. And then here is sort of here's my data. Here's the results. And here's the answer. And, you know, it may not always be that clear cut, but there are several very beautiful examples in science that I think like teach that sort of thought process, that critical thinking of how do you really um, go from having a problem to getting an answer that like it really walks you through it with science. And so I think when we communicate about science, um, it's a really nice way to sort of introduce that way of thinking to people. And they may find well, they don't end up in a career in science or they don't end up using science in their day-to-day -day life. But through that experience of learning how to apply it in a scientific context, it can then sort of empower them in other areas of their life to, to be those critical thinkers. And, you know, in just society writ large, I think the more people that we have who are really applying those critical thinking skills almost as a second nature um, you know, the more we benefit, right? I think, um, you know, that just leads to a really like, a really like thoughtful workforce. It leads to really thoughtful communities, really intentional planning and how we, you know, build things going forward. Um, strategic thinking, like I think it having that that foundation as Damien's saying of that house of like, of critical thinking is a great way to build uh, into any sort of career or any sort of, uh, you know, future. And I think science is a great vehicle for that. You're making a bit of pitch to educators and communicators, but you're also kind of making a pitch for this is a foundational societal skill that will be better. Just Canada will be better off to the extent that we're better at this. Is there is there a way here at Perimeter that we're trying to teach critical thinking? Is there an approach that we take? Damien, perhaps you could comment first. Um I would say there are many approaches. It's perhaps not a one size fits all. And you talked about meeting people where they are, which I think is a really important thing in education. And different people, whether they're a young student or even just an adult, they're gonna be at, at different stages. Um, I just say one general point often that we try to do that seems to be useful is sort of teaching critical thinking, not as some kind of separate box, but sort of integrated into the problems that we face. That it, that just makes the education and the teaching more relevant. And to pick up on Emily's point, I totally agree that it's something that not just scientists need, but society needs. Um, so if you've got someone that is really interested in the environment and climate change, perhaps one way you could, you know, introduce 
introduce them, help them with critical thinking would be using examples that are relevant to that, relevant to the data we have in that area. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to kind of resonate with them more. They're probably going to learn that more rather than if you say, okay, here are the th three key rules of critical thinking that you need to know. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of abstract approach. So I'd say that's sort of generally a good thing. And that sort of application is going to vary from person to person. But I think... Uh, to me, a big part of what we try and do is really try and engage people. Because if I want to teach people something, if I want to communicate them, unless they've got their attention, which I feel is harder and harder to do in today's world, they're not really going to learn anything. So I'm always kind of thinking, what's that sort of hook? How can I kind of engage people? And that could be different for you, for me, for Emily. Um, and just thinking of the poll, we have a pretty diverse audience. That could be a different thing. So I feel like many teachers have told me in teaching, um, one of the big things is it depends. And it does depend because humans are, are really, really complicated. And so it depends. I, I wish I had the magical kind of wand for teaching critical thinking, but I, 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 I don't. It's a good consulting answer. It depends. You can, you can <laughs> consult. Uh, is there anything you would you'd like to kind of chip in or top up on that point? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll get into sort of some of the other things about perimeter that are really special in this area as we kind of have this broader discussion. But one of the things that I think, um, you know, for our audience members who aren't as familiar with perimeter. Uh, perimeter itself is, you know, focused on theoretical physics, but we have three main areas of focus here in the building: um, research training and outreach. And that's a very intentional split. That's a very intentional three pillars of what we do here. Um, you know, research is critically important. This is this is where we drive forward new discoveries, et cetera. Damien is very focused on outreach. I think that's phenomenal. And then there's this other training bit that I think is where we, you know, we're talking about science communication. That can mean the public, that can mean policymakers. But it also means our students that we bring in the building, right? So our PhD students, our master's students, mm -hmm. undergraduates, um, you know, anyone from sort of their beginning their physics degree to uh, either going to a faculty job or using that PhD training that they gain here at Perimeter to then go on into, you know, critical, critical uh, functions in industry across Canada, around the world. And that that training bit is where I think we we bring a lot of um, a lot of focus and a lot of attention to those critical thinking skills here in the building in terms of how we train our students and our postdocs to be well rounded individuals. That it's not just we're trying to focus them on a path in academia. We're very intentional in trying to get them to even think critically about what their career looks like. Right? Do they? Mm -hmm. Uh, do they want to continue in academia? Do they want to use those skills in the finance industry, in tech, in quantum, in uh, in science communication, being a writer? Um, there's so many different paths open to them. And so we teach them those skills in terms of how do they do their science, but then also thinking critically about, you know, where does their career take them with that science education? Um, and that kind of feeds back into that, what I was talking about, that having as many critical thinkers out in the workforce as possible, you know, it's a... Um, that's that's another aspect of what we're doing here that I think is is um is really special. Great. Um, I want to uh, kind of bring us to a close on this on this set of points, but we've got a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. I think it's good a good time to take them. Mike, you can bring that that first question back up too. So uh, the first question is from Giovanna. So it, it's I'd love to hear about how science communication and science literacy are being embedded as part of higher education institutions in Canada. Anybody want to comment on that particular question? I can comment on that. Okay. Um, so I spoke a little bit about what we're doing at Perimeter, but you know, Perimeter is um, we're an independent research institute. We work, we partner extensively with uh, universities across Canada, be that the University of Waterloo here at home, um, but also universities across the country, um, both in terms of bringing uh, together you know, joint professorships, joint student opportunities, student and joint postdoc opportunities. One thing that I think we're really excited about here at Perimeter is, is you know, the, the initiative that's at the University of Waterloo that we're, uh, you know, that we're involved with the trust in science. And I think having, uh, I think universities are really starting to think uh, much more broadly about like what it means to train people to be, uh, to be science communicators, mm -hmm. to be science literate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that can be holding events like trust in science events for the general public. But also, I think 
incorporating more science literacy and more focus on communicating your own personal scientific results to, into the curriculum for PhD students. Um, I've seen this in other universities across Canada and across the world, where it's really, um, you know, not just teaching our students, here's how you present at a conference, here's how you uh, write a paper, but um, here's how you talk to a journalist. Mm. Uh, here's how you, you know, if someone, if, here's how you give an elevator pitch. Um, so I, I see those, that kind of, uh, in, that initiative uh, being kind of, um, spearheaded more and more in universities, but we're certainly, you know, that's certainly something that we're already really active in doing here at Perimeter. Are you, are you seeing the same thing earlier, Damien, in um, in maturity level or in um, in tenure in high school curricula? Is are, is that curricula changing when it comes to critical thinking? Absolutely is. Um... And for sure, it's more sort of often a sort of buzz phrase that uses sort of a skill-based curriculum that, um, yes, sort of content is important. It's important to know how to multiply, to add, et cetera. Um, but it's also important to have these skills. And I would say, you know, often there's um, key ones that are mentioned, um, critical thinking, also just communication as well, because so much is done in collaboration, even in very technical disciplines like physics. Um, and I think one of the key parts, you know, at Perimeter, the way it was designed was really to, to make that collaboration e easy because um, so many of the really big advances, I think, happening in, in sort of basic science and technology, really at the, the intersection of two traditional disciplines. So if you can kind of break down those walls, I feel like that's really valuable. Um, so for sure, people are doing that. And I know definitely other countries around the world are. So I know Singapore recently, which um, places a, a really high premium on their education. And if you looked at the content that they teach, that was always very, very high. It's a very, I'd say, sort of quote unquote smart society. But recently they've changed their education to not sort of get away from people rote learning things, to really focus on that critical thinking, on that communication, to really this... Um, more sort of softer skills because um, they feel that will be valuable and not just valuable um, really for the sake of being valuable, um, valuable really in the long run economically for for their society and just sort of sort of broader. We could probably do a whole follow-up session on benchmarks and best best practices, but uh, perhaps, perhaps another day. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to take one more uh, question. It could be a little con controversial, uh, I guess, uh, but it uh, it's a good time to take it. So the question that's come in is, how do we navigate science communication on social uh, in a landscape that is deeply polarized? Anybody want to take that on? Yeah, I can, I can try. I mean, I think we'll also get into it a bit when we talk about meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. um, social media, I think particularly tends to be this sort of, um, you feel this sort of culture of immediacy, this need to respond immediately with something punchy or like, um, you know, justify something very quickly. So I think social is very challenging in some ways. Um, but overall, I think as a science communicator or someone who is trying to really um, communicate the, the the truth or the 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 actual like fundamentals of a result, um, I think what's important is just to understand first, you know, where people are coming from. What are you interested in? What's your what's your understanding of this topic? Um, what are you most worried about with this topic? Um, what is it about this particular subject that um, maybe makes you uh, feel fearful or feel like nervous or annoyed or <laughs> angry even? Um, understanding that first before trying to communicate on the topic, I think is always a good start, right? Um, that way, like you're not just totally off the mark and um, trying to communicate to them in a way where you think, well, this is definitely going to work, but it's just, they're off in some completely different direction. So understanding sort of um, who is your audience first, and maybe there's, you know, there's some sort of fundamental reason why some topic is deeply polarized for them. That's, that's fine. That's who that person is. That's, you know, the sort of understanding that they have, but then sort of meeting them at that point and saying like, okay, I understand that, you know, maybe this is, this is, you know, based on sort of past experiences or what you've read in the news or something that's some sort of, you know, deeper anxiety around this topic, um, let's unpack it, right? And um, I think not shying away from those conversations is really important. I don't think you should just write people off. I don't think that that's acceptable and I don't think that they deserve that. I think um, meeting them where they are and trying to figure out a way to communicate 
so that you know teach them something so that they can learn something I think even if you don't end up agreeing on a topic even in science um, that's okay um, I think even our you know many scientists in our building would say that they deeply disagree with someone else in their field and they're still collaborating they're still yeah. working together right. part of the process it's part of the process yeah. okay um, let's shift gears quantum and AI came up in the intros, unsurprisingly, uh, we know we want to spend a few minutes on this. Maybe we could start with a little bit of a baseline, uh, yeah. just, just a definition for the audience so that we're oriented kind of around the same ideas. Damien, do you want to? I'll take that yeah, ab absolutely. So um, I guess for me, it's almost sort of taking a step backwards. And we look at, you know, all of the technologies we use and we take for granted today, like uh, like my phone here, the internet. Mm. And you kind of ask where they came from. They didn't just kind of come out of thin air. Every technological advance that's really transformed society has really come from, from basic science. And, you know, back in the 19th century, some sort of clever scientists really advanced our understanding of electricity, of magnets. And then later on, you know, um, entrepreneurs, engineers came along and they built on that understanding. And, you know, and we have wireless communication now, which is, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. It's changed society. Um, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, and this is a pattern that's happened time and time again throughout history, throughout society. And really the latest kind of um, version of that, the latest iteration of that is that um, really early 19th century, we finally were able to really explore nature at what we think is a fundamental level at really the fundamental sort of building blocks, these atoms, these electrons, these molecules that we think up make up, you know, everything in the universe, the, the chairs you're sitting on now, mm. uh, the screen that you're staring at. Um, and that was a great advance in basic science. And we're at this stage now where with quantum, people are building so-called quantum technologies. These are um, technologies that um, sort of build on, take these kind of these crazy ideas, which may seem like they just belong in an ivory tower in quantum physics about atoms and electrons. And, and come up with ideas for sort of transformative new technologies. Um, and perhaps the biggest one of those is quantum computers. Uh, what is a quantum computer? Well, um, I mean, computers now, just regular computers, they're uh, amazing. Um, they can do all sorts of things, but there are a lot of problems that we want to solve tied to climate change, tied to finding new medicines, that even with the current trajectory, with the most powerful supercomputers that we have, they'll never be able to solve them. The, the amount of data you would need is just too much. Mm. But a quantum computer is really just a completely different type of computer um, based on the laws of quantum physics. So it's not just like the next version, the next model of your regular computer. And if we could build them and people have prototypes, but we're still working on that, the idea is we could solve a lot of these big challenges that we're facing. And so that's sort of one example of a quantum technology. So that's kind of perhaps sort of what what quantum is. And we're at, I would say, a really exciting time or a really important time, maybe maybe an inflection point that we think of, you know, the information age, you think of the internet um, starting in the late 80s, 90s, kind of becoming commercial. We're kind of like perhaps that with kind of maybe if I could be so bold, the, the quantum age, where we're being able to sort of sort of harness this in some way world at the most basic fundamental level. Um, and so we're really in a, at the, the ground floor of that. And so quantum is both very, very basic science. At Perimeter, we have a lot of people, a lot of people around the world work on that. They perhaps aren't focused on the technologies, but it's also these transformative new spin-off technologies, which it's fair to say are in their infancy now, um, but they have you know untold potential. So we, we know that um, something is of interest uh, more broadly once it makes its way out of science into the newspaper and then eventually into movies. We're, we've certainly arrived at that yeah. moment with quantum. Yeah. We think a lot about students and teachers. We think about policymakers. Mm -hmm. Policymakers are starting to take an interest in quantum. Emily, could you talk a bit about that and the kind of the work that you do in that area? For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I imagine that many of our audience members have heard the term quantum and many of the policymakers and politicians maybe have even thought about, um, you know, 
what is our response supposed to be about around quantum? Mm -hmm. What should it be around quantum? Um, you know, people may not even fully understand even what Damien, how Damien really wonderfully explained it. What is what is quantum? What's it good for? Um, this is something that I do hear from, uh, you know, in the sort of government sectors and just sort of with with funders, right? Not just government funders. Um, you know, what is quantum good for? Because I think it's a very reasonable um, approach and a very like um, it's very reasonable for for government funders to be wondering about what are the applications here. You know, this is um, how does this apply to the average person? How is this going to benefit Canada? Um, and I think with quantum, uh, you know, we hear a lot about this. We hear, you know, sort of like, what are we, you know, what, what should our response around quantum be? Canada as a country has launched its national quantum strategy earlier this year in January of this year. It's a hundreds of millions of dollar investment in quantum research, technology, companies, uh, universities, industry, um, really to try to push forward this whole quantum industry. And I think uh, it's one of the things that we often communicate around quantum to, to people in government is that it is, it's a balance, it's a give and take, right? So there is this sort of immediate commercialization potential around certain types of quantum technology. And there are startups that are being, uh, you know, spun out of research, even just of research institutes. There are small companies, there's, you know, industry and university partnerships that are being uh, put together around quantum technologies. But then there's this other side of quantum, which is the continued investment in basic research, because there are investigations happening in places like Perimeter Institute um, into sort of quantum foundations, for example, which is really just the fundamental behavior of quantum material, quantum particles. Uh, and you may not think, well, that's not quite commercializable. It's really just the mathematics of the you know building blocks of matter. Um, but what we're finding is that algorithms and methods that are used to describe quantum phenomena in the most theoretical sense can then be taken into industry contexts to solve problems in statistical mechanics and things like causal inference and why, like whether one thing predicts another thing, the mathematics that we're building mm. in these sort of very fun, phys very, very theoretical areas can directly, you know, move into uh, very much more applied areas without even really predicting that that was possible, right? I think one of these things in quantum is what we're seeing is that even if you continue in an area of basic research for a purely, uh, in for, you know, for basic fundamental interest, that even if you can't quite predict where the technology will come from, that basic research will eventually lead to to fundamental new technologies. We've seen this time and time again in science, not just in quantum, Wi-Fi, supercomputers, uh, you know, faster communications, transistors, all of these things came from theoretical physics where people were pushing questions about why. It was this real interest in why is the physics the way it is. Mm -hmm. They were not necessarily thinking with a full eye to commercialization, but these discoveries in theoretical physics just naturally kind of organically moved into this commercializable space and now make up the basis of everything that we all the technology we currently use. And I think that quantum is is very much poised to be exactly the same. This is not lost on our policymakers. They may, they, the science is hard, but they understand the implications are huge, trying to get their heads around it. Yeah. Yeah. You spend quite a bit of time with teachers and kids, Damien. Are, are these groups starting to pay attention to quantum? Do they have questions about quantum? Uh, absolutely, they, they, they are. Um, and that's something that yeah, people hear about through the media um, and on online, especially um, young people, especially um, there's, you know, a million videos. You just just um, search on YouTube kind of quantum videos. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the media before Ant-Man, Paul Rudd, the, there's multiple movies. Um, so, yeah, it definitely has gone into the mainstream and it's something people hear about it perhaps sounds a bit mysterious and so i think definitely has kind of captured quite a few people's attention um and there is sort of a push to sort of 
te teach more quantum. And so this is actually something we sort of have been working on for a while and we continue to work on is really how you can kind of sort of build on that and really sort of authentically create um, some kind of resources which, which teach people a little bit about quantum, um, perhaps not too much, but also fit that into the curriculum. Um, because I think people often do focus on how different, how strange, how mysterious quantum is. And yes, it does have elements of those. Um, but there are many ideas that it builds on. I think every new thing in some ways build on what came before it. And so there are ideas that we've had about even waves, about measuring things, which we do a lot in physics that quantum really builds on, that really the early kind of quantum sort of scientists like Einstein and others were think of think of and so these are things that are already in the curriculum that we try and sort of tap into and build um and teach people content but but as before also just sort of to get people sort of excited to to really get them engaged and to hopefully start them on their own quantum journey because i think once you're interested in quantum there's basically an infinite amount of resources out there varying quality online that if you're a self-starter again if you kind of have that ability to learn you can kind of keep going for yourself and so we really just try and sort of kick start that that journey of people and and yeah I'll, I'll build on what Damien was saying though and in, in terms of uh you know trying to get people engaged with quantum and and get them uh interested kind of that, that starting point I will just uh you know shamelessly take a moment to plug the perimeters quantum 101 videos um so our our uh, as part of our science communication around quantum we have a, a 10 piece series of i uh, short pretty digestible videos around what is quantum what does it mean where did it come from mm. what's coming next um and with the hope that you know members of the public members of the interested you know, policymaking community can watch those videos and kind of get a sense for at least the, the sort of ground level of quantum and, and you know, a launching point for, for, you know, finding out more. Let's talk a little bit about AI before we move on. So a uh, funny story from yesterday, I spent um, a day with a group of people in, uh, in Hamilton um, and that, you know, they're trying to put a sort of a significant project together uh, AI is tied to it. We brought in an AI expert, lovely, smart gentleman from uh, from Montreal. And he started with um, just a show of hands in the room, 20 or so folks in the room. And he said, uh, how many in here, uh, how many people in here would trust their lives with AI, right? And uh, almost no hands. And he mm -hmm. said, you're all liars, mm -hmm. basically, uh, because if you fly on a commercial airplane, you're trusting your life to AI all the time. And he, he was trying to illustrate this idea that there's a bit of fear in the, in the ether right now around AI. And it's, um, it's perhaps uh, hyped a bit. And I'm, I'm sure in your work, you see this and is, is fear and AI, is, is that a bit of a barrier when it comes to education and, and science comms? Um, I, I, I would say, yes, it is. And I've heard from some teachers that some students, and I think a lot of people in the general public do have that kind of fear of AI, which I think is is very reasonable because it can seem mysterious, scary. And, you know, if you look at um, the, the, you know, the worst case predictions, AI is going to take over type of thing. Um, it, it, it can, I think, is very um, a common natural response to be fearful. Um, and I think we do want to be wary, we want to be cautious about AI, not be um, overly naive about it, but also be realistic about it. And I think to your point about people sort of trusting their lives and not saying they trust their lives to AI, um, AI has been around for a while. Like, yes, it's getting better. Yes, you know, there's chat GPT, but it's being around for, for, for a long time, a part of our daily lives. If you've done a, a Google search that uses machine learning, which is a type of AI that's been around since the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, if you follow Netflix's recommendations, that's AI, mm -hmm. you know, there's machine learning there. So um, it's something that I think is sort of less scary, less abstract than, um, than people think. Um, so I always like to, to kind of sort of build on that. And the thing that I think about, whether I'm fearful of it or I'm very excited about it, I kind of feel like it's coming, it's hurtling along. So for me, I don't know, I just try and um, 
just learn about it as much as I can, um, try and teach people about it as much as I can, um, and really like your point that whatever decisions I make, whatever I feel about it, are the most sort of informed, the most sort of rational decisions as, as, as much as I can, that I think as I make as an individual, that I think, you know, hopefully policy makers make as individual, and business people as make as individual in terms of where to invest, what technology to invest in it a lot, to me, it's that that knowledge is 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 power, and not be I'd say irrationally fearful of it. As 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 challenging as it is, it's very easy for me to sit here in this comfortable chair and say that. Um, it feels like every day online there's some new kind of story I read about AI, but you know I just feel like I try my best, and perhaps it kind of comes back to this this critical thinking. That the stronger you are at critical thinking, the stronger you are you can sort through the news stories or et cetera, to figure out, frankly, what is hype and, and what is real. Yeah, I was just about to bring it back to the critical thinking, because I think that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's very, it's very human and very natural to, if we don't understand something, to be cautious, wary, fearful. Um, but having that basis in critical thinking can, can help you take that step back and say, well, why do I think that? You know, what evidence supports that? What is it actually doing? Maybe I can, you know, use my critical thinking skills to understand a bit more about what is happening under the hood. What is machine learning? Where are my Netflix recommendations coming from? Um, and uh, actually, you know, kind of put it together for yourself in a way that reassures you or make at least makes sense to you. Um, and so I think teaching that critical thinking around, especially around topics in quantum and AI, is really important because these things change really fast. Um, I think something that both Damien and I, and I have talked about before is just it's um, it's one thing to teach people the current state of the art in quantum or in AI uh, on, you know, this date, November 3rd, 2023. Um, that could be out of date by December 3rd, 2023. Um, so the material, the actual like what is the state of the art is maybe less important than understanding what is the evolution of this technology? What is happening under the hood? Um, how does it work? Mm. And then, you know, when you're, you know, when it's December 3rd, 2023, and you need to understand what's the state of the art in quantum, you have the critical thinking skills to be able to go out there and, and understand that information for yourself or, you know, answer that question to your satisfaction rather than, you know, being, being, said, being told like, oh, well, I was taught about quantum two years ago. So I think I know exactly what it's doing. Chances are that has changed um, because these technologies are changing extremely rapidly. So when we communicate about them to the, to the public, to policymakers, to students, to teachers, mm -hmm. it's less, I think it should be less focused on, you know, here is exactly the truth and like exactly how it works and exactly what it is and how, you know, what is what is the state of the art and more about um well here are the building blocks here's how you would answer that question for yourself if you if i wasn't in this room and you wanted to know more about what is quantum um so those are the kind of teaching like critical thinking skills around quantum and ai that i think are very very important for people as they use these technologies as these technologies kind of come into the mainstream as as they start being adopted more broadly is really teaching people just how to think about them um, so that it, it makes sense. So we've, we've put some building blocks together in this conversation. We started with the idea of critical thinking and how important it is. Um, we talked a little bit about some techniques there and we've got, you've both made the argument, we've got kind of a willing audience. We've got, uh, we've got a, a, a series of governments. We've got policymakers. We've got schools that are thinking about this and wanting to get better. Uh, then we kind of layered in fundamentals in education and science comms, again, willing audiences there. Uh, so that, that kind of brings us to this point where we want to, we want to move into thinking about meeting people where they are, which you've both brought up as a kind of a meta theme or a meta question. We've got another one that came in from the audience and I think we can address this directly in a few minutes, but maybe it sort of gets interwoven into the answers as we kind of go through some of the questions we want to get to. So the audience question is, how do we communicate science in a way that incorporates diverse values and worldviews? We obsess about that uh, here at Perimeter. So maybe we just keep this in mind as we yeah. as we work our way through. So when 
when we're communicating outside of science uh, about developments in science, whether they're theoretical or in general, how are we thinking about tailoring messages? Yeah, I think when, uh, I mean, I think you need to tailor the message to the audience, right? I mean, if I, uh, if I go into a room of policymakers and I just start launching into, uh, you know, a 45 minute colloquium talk about my research and fast radio bursts, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's super interesting to me, <laughs> but it's not interesting mm -hmm. to them. And it's not, it's not actually helping them make any decisions. It's not helping them get information, the information from me that they need to maybe if I'm asking for something or if we need something or if there is a wider, uh, you know, initiative that that needs that kind of support, like that's that's not a helpful way of communicating. So understanding the audience in a way that, uh, you know, tailoring the message uh, to to make it as as smooth as possible, right? I think it it's it's our responsibility as science communicators that it should be as straightforward as possible for our audience to understand what we're trying to tell them. They shouldn't sort of have to be like looking at Wikipedia along the way to understand a word I just said. Um, you know, I want to make my message as clear as possible. That's really challenging to do sometimes with theoretical physics, um, but it's possible and it takes practice. Um, but I think that's where we achieve the best results, right? I think that's where um, people truly understand uh, if I'm doing my job correctly, if I'm tailoring that message correctly, people understand why what we're doing here is important, why fundamental f physics and why basic research are are critical to, you know, to society. Um, I see that as the communicator's job to really try to understand who am I talking to? Have you ever heard of any of the topics I'm about to talk about before? Yes or no? If no, fantastic. Let's start from let's start from the very beginning and let's make sure we all understand along the way. I think that's part of this sort of accessibility and like incorporating diverse views is not just assuming that your audience is exactly like you and that they understand what you understand and that if they don't understand it, they're uh you know, that that prevents presents some sort of value judgment. I don't think that that's true. I think it's, you know, it's your job as a communicator to incorporate to to bring as as diverse a group of people along with you for the ride, making sure that you're starting from a place where everybody understands. Okay? Yeah, I totally um agree with that. and and I love the fact that you kind of mentioned sort of asking questions, which is, I feel a really powerful way to communicate and really to, to meet audiences in the middle. And one thing I heard someone say um, many years ago was that communication is a two-way process. If I wanna explain something to you or to you, it's not just about me, okay, be quiet, shut up, I'm just gonna talk at you. Asking questions is a super thing. And you had that great question, like I would applaud that AI expert that asked, you know, how many of you would, um, basically devote your life, you know, would, would sort of give your life to kind of AI. Um, I think that's a the great way. The other thing I just put in a plug for is I think also sort of jargon is something to be very aware of and every area has its jargon. Um, AI, quantum in particular, mm -hmm. I think every single, single specialty. And I think that something when you're communicating is just to be very aware of that, that for me with quantum, I have all these ideas and these terms and frankly definitions of entanglement superposition in my head um, that I know. So I think it's just trying minimizing the jargon but also if I kind of do use it to kind of define my terms. And that's something where, I don't know if there are any sort of journalists in the audience, but that's something where I feel that journalists do very well. I know some journalists, they think about that. Um, I could probably learn a lot from them, but they're very aware of, of their audience. So that's for me, another big thing about minimizing the jargon, maybe not always avoiding it because it can be very powerful. It's exactly that word, but just, I think being aware of that, because I think definitely you could read a quantum article and hear a quantum expert and, and the great everyone tries, but it's just very natural to start sprouting off all of these, basically talking another language, um, which I feel can be really a barrier to communication. Yeah. Kind of brings us to tools, methods, vehicles. Are there, are there some tricks of the trade here that come into play? I think about, um, metaphors, I think about examples, you talked about definitions, What what's in your toolkit as, as you 
as you do your work, Damien? Um, yeah, sort of metaphors, absolutely. I feel that um, a good analogy is, is very, very powerful. Um, and even the question that is, you know, I'm talking about atoms, how, how small is an atom? Um, one analogy that I've heard is if you take, um, on the one hand, let's say a baseball stadium, on the other hand, a grain of sand, and everyone can understand those. And you kind of think of just how much smaller that grain of sand is and that baseball stadium. Well, imagine that the grain of sand is a baseball stadium and you imagine something about as small again, it's about a million times smaller. That's about how small, how big, a single atom is. Mm. And so that's sort of an analogy. Um, it's not perfect, but it's about the best I know of kind of just getting a sense of the scale. Um, really just, again, meeting people where that people know what grains of sand are, people know what baseball mm. stadiums are, um, but even just kind of getting a sense to really kind of bring people along, make it um, more tangible. And the other thing, it's not maybe, um, very exciting, but I feel as I've come to do more science communication, I feel that less and less I'm going to get it right the, the first time. So I often just um, really almost doing an experiment. So I have an idea, basically I'll, I'll bug my wife, I'll find someone, maybe someone at Perimeter and say, hey, I've got this idea for explaining quantum, you know, it's blah, 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 blah. How is that? And then almost run the experiment, get some feedback on that. And based on that, kind of refine it. Because I feel like I've gotten um, just really more realistic that I'm not going to get this perfect thing where I can come up with this explanation and that some other human brain, which is incredibly complex, probably way more complex than quantum physics is going to get that. Mm. So I really have this fumbling around trial and error process. And if I can kind of avoid making a mistake, it's not maybe um, the most sort of exciting and direct way, but I, I feel just, just having that, that is an approach, just an experimental way um, to kind of science communication and just sort of junking the things that, that don't work and keeping so it, what- It's what very science-based. Very science-based yeah, approach. Yeah. Do, you, do you have an, an arrow in your, in your quiver in terms of the tool or- Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but I really like what you're talking about because I think- um, you know, just like you're saying, maybe I don't always have the right way of communicating it the very first time, I think, and, and you know, honing that message so that you come up with a, a better analogy. Mm -hmm. I think also similarly, you may find as you communicate to people that the first way you try doesn't always resonate with them, mm -hmm. right? And so you may say like, oh, it's, you know, I, I think that having part of a toolkit of science communication is having multiple ways to explain one thing, mm -hmm. because not everyone is going to resonate with the one way you explain it. I think that is, you know, quite unfortunately, one of the reasons why some people have a bad experience in a physics classroom is because their teacher explains it one way and they say like, well, that, I don't understand that way. And maybe their teacher doesn't have another way of explaining it to them or just, you know, doesn't have the opportunity or doesn't, you know, take the time to explain it a different way. And, um, you know, physics is not going to be something that explaining it one single way is always going to work for everyone we you know okay that that one didn't resonate with you let's try something more visual okay that didn't resonate with you let's try something more math based like okay that didn't work like let's try something that's a bit more like step by step so having that i think part of a toolkit of explaining science is finding multiple ways to deliver the same message to different audiences right um but in terms of in my sort of toolkit i think um one thing that I really uh, I, I find really resonates, um, especially at the policy level, is is examples and stories. Um, I mentioned a few times before, you know, uh, past examples of science that has you know led to technological innovation. But I think a great example is you know what I an example that I always really like to use, and I think really speaks to some of the importance of basic research is you know the example of the transistor right so um in the early 1900s uh we had developed this technology called vacuum tubes they were used to move electrons from a to b and were used to power many devices mm -hmm. um and but vacuum tubes were unreliable they were they were kind of uh they broke very easily they um you know they weren't very efficient uh they were expensive and people were investing lots and lots of money in building better vacuum tubes 
you know, this was sort of seen as the path forward. We have vacuum tubes, let's keep building better vacuum tubes. Um, and then it wasn't until sort of the 1950s that theoretical physicists, experimental physicists were looking at Maxwell's equations. We're saying there's gotta be a better way to transport electrons across a material. Um, you know, they're working with superconductors. Um, and then they built this prototype device called the transistor that turned out to be not a vacuum tube at all, but to do the job a vacuum tube was meant to do much, much more efficiently. It was a total, you know, shift in technology based on just trying to push the boundaries of physics. And when you'd ask them, you know, what is a what is this transistor going to be good for? You know, they had some applications. They thought, oh, better hearing aids could go in some technology, replace some vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. They had no idea that transistors would be a trillion dollar global industry uh, that is, you know, powers every single thing that we touch and interact with on a daily basis. And this was, you know, just purely inquiry based mm -hmm. physics that led to this amazing technological revolution. This is sort of the story that I tell around quantum because I think it's very powerful. Um, but we find that that story really resonates with people because it's a very clear example of, you know, it's not just about, you know, trying to build something better and better, but also just trying to look for those, those massive leaps in understanding that you never know where they're going to come from. So I find that stories like that tend to resonate very well with people and, and provide really powerful examples for, you know, for why. Yeah. Great. So we've, we've got definitions, we've got analogies, we've got examples, we've got uh, a question that came in. Uh, it, it got touched on a little bit, but the, the question here is visual representations or highly graphical representations, yeah. illustrations. Are they effective? Are they misleading? How do you how do you feel about them? Yeah, I I, mean, I, <laughs> I feel, yeah, personally, I'm a big fan of them. Yes, they can be misleading. You have to approach them with some caution. Mm. But I think in a big way, many people are visual creatures and it's that old thing, a picture tells a thousand words. So I could explain in two minutes, well, I think you talked about the fast radio burst and there's this telescope, this is Canada world leading telescope called Chime. And I can explain it that it's like these four half pipes and you know, there's some chicken wire there and it's like this angle and it's this big and stuff like that. But if I show someone a picture of that, um, I think that's a very efficient way of communication, communicating what something is about, a, a complex idea. And if I can get some moving pictures, maybe it's an animation, maybe it's a real video, then yeah, I think that can be very powerful, just a very, very efficient way for communicating something into, into human neurons, into the human brain. Mm. Um, so obviously... I think with quantum, it's got this reputation as as maybe something that's impossible to visualize. So there are some challenges in doing with that. So I think like with anything in science communication, you need to handle it with care, do it authentically and accurately. But if you can do that, ab absolutely. Um, and you mentioned, um, I think, you know, social media came up before that if, I don't know, you're trying to, um, on Instagram or TikTok or something like that, if you've got something, a picture, a little short 15 second clip or something that kind of fits in with really that, that medium that you're trying to communicate on, um, to me, that's, it sort of fits that format. Um, that to me can be very, very powerful. And also, you know, as people's sort of attention spans get very, very short, um, I think it can be a very useful way of um, communicating science. Uh, maybe not all of it, maybe just to sort of start, but yeah, I'm, I'm generally a, a, a big fan of, of, of that. All right, great. So, so lots of uh, tools that we've put in the, in the toolkit. We're at we're at one o'clock. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, the questions are starting to flow in. Uh, we, we, we've got some quantum fans in the audience, uh, but I think we'll hold those until we get into sort of the formal Q&A. We've got one more segment that we want to do, and it's about challenges and about the future. And I think we should try to be kind of specific here and let's not pull punches. So if we, if we think about challenges first, science topics, audiences, Let's talk about governments and and funders, Emily, and just what what are the challenges that you see in these two spheres? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I see as a challenge in uh, you know in policymaking around science is 
trying to strike that very delicate balance uh, in between um, a pure focus on commercial applications and a long-term strategy around basic research. This is a really difficult needle to thread, and I understand that. I think it has to be it has to be balanced, right? Um, of course, there's this sort of short-term gain um, and absolutely necessary advantage that Canada needs to keep in our advance in quantum technologies, in medical research, in batteries, um, in critical minerals, right? We need we need investment in those areas because that is where we're where we're presently very competitive. We're very strong. And where there's this sort of immediate or short-term potential for payoff that can improve the lives of Canadians. Um, that being said, there's those transistors out there somewhere, you know, the future transistor yeah. that really requires that the base really requires basic fundamental research being done now to enable the transistor of 50 to 100 years from now coming from Canada you know, from that, for that technology to be a Canadian technology. And so keeping both those sectors alive, both the, um, that, that those immediately commercializable like applicable technologies and that basic research, I think that balance is, is really critical. And, you know, we try to communicate around that. We try to, um, you know, understand it, you know, as you said, communication is a two-way street. We try to communicate, you know, sort of how we feel about that. I think I'm doing that right now, but you know, we also understand and we hear and we listen about, you know, what is it that 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 really could be those technologies and, and what is of interest to to policymakers. And so keeping that open dialogue, I think, has been very successful in Canada. And I think um, regardless of, you know, how much gets put into what bucket or, you know, what the strategy ends up being, I think maintaining that really open line of communication between people doing science and people in science policy is uh, is critically important. So, you know, I think going forward, just continuing that that back and forth communication, what are the, what do you need from us? What do we need from you? What do you want to learn from us? What do what would we like to learn from you? Um, I think that that really benefits us all. Right. We have. Um, so we have a mutual friend, Mike, who hangs around Ottawa and hangs around Queens Park and some provincial legislatures a bit, and it, I think he would say there's a there's a bit of an attention span piece too, where these people are so busy, their portfolios are large, it's incumbent on, upon them to understand a range of topics, and they're scrolling right through emails in the back of taxis, yeah. forty five seconds at a time. Does do you see that, and does that create a bit of a a challenge with with some of your audiences? Just just the sheer a shortage of time they have to absorb science comms. Definitely, and I think that that's not uh, that's that's not a criticism either. I think like they are, you know, our business is science, and their business is is policy. They have so much in their portfolio. You know, science is part of it, um, and I think part of the importance of science communication in those areas, meeting people where they are, is um, you know, a policymaker. Um, doesn't need to necessarily have like a strong background in science. Like the average policymaker or politician that I speak to, um, you know, doesn't have. I don't think I've talked to. I've only talked to one that actually has like a uh, like a bachelor's degree in physics, right? So right. it's not it, that's not a requisite, and and that's that's our job, right? To to make it mm -hmm. uh, make a compelling case and why it's important. Start from the beginning, like, um, and what you know in terms of what we need. Uh, just understanding from them, like, you know, where are you at right now? What do you need from us? What would you like to understand more of? Um, so that really open line of communication, even if it's this really brief attention span, but like having that open dialogue, uh, I think is really helpful for everyone. Yeah. If you think about where we started, there's a bit of trust building that happens earlier too, right? Yeah. To just to maintain it. What about teachers and, and kids, Damien? You're you're skilled at what you do. Mm -hmm. you're, you're an eternal optimist. We can tell. What What do you run up against? What do you find tough? Well, I think a lot about the next generation of scientists and engineers, um, especially more so having kids and maybe they'll grow up to be scientists or who knows. Mm -hmm. um, but really just for young people, keeping them sort of engaged and excited about science and conversely not 
sort of disengaged. Um, not necessarily teaching in the latest and keeping up with pace of technology, which is which is almost impossible, but just really that awareness, keeping them aware of just that possibility in the future that this is something that they can do and this is a really, really exciting field. And just really making that, I think, opening their eyes up to, to the possibilities of um, the future, this amazing, hopefully amazing future that they'll inherit, that they'll mm. they'll live in, where there'll be all sorts of um, opportunities. So it's really, I think, getting people excited about kind of new, current, exciting, the next gen sort of science and technology. And also, um, I mean, I'm biased too, but hoping that though we'll have opportunities to to do that sort of within Canada with, you know, there'll be a lot of great industries, jobs, et cetera, that a lot of this um, exciting science and tech will be happening in the future 10, 20 years from now, kind of within Canada. Um, I kind of think about that. So it's really that engagement, which I think I kind of see as, as foundational, especially as um, just the pace of change and the volume of change increases, just stopping people from, from getting disengaged. Yeah, I have kids too, and uh, they pay more attention to LeBron James than they <laughs> do what I have to say about science. And I think maybe, maybe we should just sign him. <laughs> that would be, that'd be a way to, to, uh, to get over a barrier. Um, we don't, we don't want to toot our own horns too much, but there are some things that we do here that that we think are kind of effective. Are there some best practices out of this place that the audience could glom onto and say, okay, that's that's something I could take away from this in terms of getting over the barriers we just we just mm -hmm. laid out? I don't know, Damien, if you want to start. Yeah, one thing I think Perimeter has had, you mentioned sort of the outreach as being one of our sort of three mandates along with training and research. Um, since day one, Perimeter has really had outreach be kind of a collaboration. And that's between sort of active researchers, researchers in the perimeter building at the forefront of science, science communicators, science translators at my, and myself, and perhaps most critically, real teachers out there in real world classrooms that see, you know, 60, 70 students per day, day in, day out. Mm. And really each of those sort of bringing their skills and knowledge to the table and meeting kind of somewhere in the middle. So the outreach resources we create, the classroom lessons that we create are uh, yes um, absolutely current with the science sort of spot on in terms of their accuracy talking about trust things that um, teachers can trust but also kind of relevant that hit these curriculum topics these things that teachers have to teach but also are at the right level because I think it would be very easy um, to create resources which you know if you just let researchers do it they'd be way too advanced and kind of complicated so really hitting that kind of sweet spot where you're authentically teaching kids something but pitched at the right level fitting with the curriculum and also using um, really best practice in terms of pedagogies teaching strategy which is really important and so for me it's it's, it's mixing all of these ingredients together. Nobody knows at all that's kind of collaboration piece and creating the outreach resources, which we have kind of free online. Um, any teacher anywhere around the world across Canada can download. Um, that's kind of something that I've just sort of observed firsthand. I feel has sort of been quite effective, bringing all these stakeholders to the table um, that you need and, and kind of creating something sort of that synergy better than, you know, the sum of the parts. Emily, is there something we do here that you, you, you think we should expand on? I think I would just build on what Damien said, because I'm always just so, uh, I'm so impressed with everything that our outreach team does for, uh, for teachers and for students. Um, the one thing that I was so impressed with when I started at Perimeter was learning about our teacher network, mm -hmm. um, which is just an incredible initiative that I've seen uh I see it as a strategy that Perimeter has adopted over the years to look at, okay, how do we maximize impact? And the strategy behind the teacher network is teaching teachers who can then also empower and train other mm -hmm. teachers, yeah. right? So if you think about, um, you know, how you can make the biggest impact, you can look at, you know, what is the maximum number of students that our outreach team uh, can really access or or uh, or talk to or visit uh, or do a workshop with in a given year, um, that's a finite number. Uh, but then, how many teachers 
can you can you uh, can you train or provide resources to? And then, as Damien says, those teachers see many many students every day, every year. Um, so this the strategy of a teacher network, um, I think, is really powerful. I think it works very well in terms of how we uh, do science communication and outreach to to students. Mm. Um, I think that's maybe something that uh, those on you know who are listening online, that sort of that strategy around maximizing impact is is really powerful and in, in you know finding those kinds of things like oh if we train teachers and they in turn can t- train their students and other teachers this really creates this incredible network of science education and um, that's something that like. I had not seen until I came to Perimeter and um, was an approach that I, I found to be novel and very impactful. Okay, super. So we're um, we're arriving at the formal Q&A part of the discussion. Uh, we've said uh, sort of a number of uh, pieces in place, I think. Uh, we, we can see two on screen uh, that are to do with quantum. We'll hold those for a second. Emily, I want to stay with you. So in in the summer, I was I was very fortunate. I spent a, a little bit of time in uh, Italy with my family, and one of the things that reminded me, which is the same thing, any time I get as sort of outside of North America, I'm reminded how much of a North American worldview, in fact, I have. Uh, that's good and bad at the same time. Um, and we had that question earlier about values and worldviews, and we touched it, but we didn't really hit it. So I'd I'd love for you to kind of hit that directly as we think about science comms. How do we account for worldviews and and values and make sure we're not we're not so biased? I guess. Yeah, I think it's um, it can be challenging, right? Because uh, you know, you approach uh, communication. I approach communication with my own worldview that comes with my own biases, my own understanding, my own jargon, um, and to maximize your impact with science communication you really, you want to be reaching as diverse of an audience as possible. Um, So I think that on some level, this starts with yourself. This starts with, uh, like, to me, this is sort of how I see it. It starts with myself. Um, It doesn't necessarily mean uh, undoing my worldview, but it does mean understanding my biases, Yes. right? So this is things like, um, you know, understanding implicit biases through like an implicit association test or something like that, understanding the cultural lens and the, uh, you know, the spheres of power or the spheres of privilege that you occupy as you come in and you, you talk about something, um, understanding, uh, you know, what sort of background has led you to the understanding that you currently have and having some empathy as you speak to other people, some understanding of Um, different paths that people have walked or different backgrounds that they may have or different biases that they may have, right? Um, And I think so if if you can better understand sort of the lens that you bring to your own communication and on some level correct for that if possible, but at least um, let that be in, you know, bring that uh, unconscious bias to a conscious level so that you can correct for it or you can uh, mitigate it um, to reach as large of an audience as possible in an, as accessible of a way as possible. I see that as like a very important first step when communicating um, and understanding. And I think being understanding, I think it it can be sometimes challenging for a scientist to say like, no, this is the way it is. These are, these are the laws of physics, right? Um, but people have different ways of knowing, people have different worldviews, people have different cosmologies and histories. And, um, you know, all of those things make that person who they are and also are a, a val- very valid cosmology, right? It's, you know, it's it's part of their understanding of the universe and incorporating that into how you teach them and incorporating that, how you, how do you communicate to them um, can not only uh, you know, you're not only maybe you're not only communicating something you want them to learn, but I think you can learn a lot in return. Um, so I think I think we try very hard to do this at Perimeter, and I think, think I try to do this in my own science communication, is just understanding your audience, not just you know have have you taken a physics class, but also you know what is your you know what is your worldview, where are you coming from, what is your background, and and um, you know how can I tailor this message to to be something that that uh, not only that you understand but that respects uh, that point of view that you have. Great. 
Okay. So let's get to the quantum questions. <laughs> you, sir, do not have a monopoly on quantum. You get the first one, but I'm going to give uh, Emily the second one. So the first one uh, talks about the value of introducing either elementary or middle school students to quantum. So earlier, uh, is there value? Uh, are there suggestions about concepts or activities that would work well yeah. for a younger audience? That's really great. And that's something that I think about. My son is uh, nine years old now. He, he definitely he knows what a quantum computer is. Um, but I, you know, I mean, my personal opinion um, is that I think, you know, there's value in just sort of teasing the idea of quantum, even just telling them about it. You know, I've continually been amazed at what students, you know, their brains are like sponges, mm. what they kind of absorb. Um, you talked about stories. There are actually some nice stories, um, even some kids books that have some quantum physics injected into them that um, cartoons, for example. So I feel like there's value um, in sort of maybe even just, you know, as my son is learning to read, just insert that quantum storybook there. Um, but in terms of going any further, maybe, but I really personally, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but I really wouldn't obsess over at that age. What I'm most interested in is not that, you know, kids personally know, you know, knowledge piece of knowledge a b and c about quantum but just that they're curious about the world you know i you know for, i for really them. so yeah e e exactly okay. um you know that they're tinkering stuff with stuff they're playing with lego they're you know building robots and stuff like that and i think that's really a foundational and certainly when i've sort of heard of you know the stories and the biographies i've chatted with a lot of the researchers in this building and scientists in general what they were like with their kids most of them were not you know studying black holes from when they were five they were just tinkering they were just really curious about toys and stuff like that and eventually you know this specific interest in physics kind of came at a later stage yeah. so i feel like that is is where the most value is there are some nice resources out there that people are building i wouldn't totally want to go away from that if you get a really keen group of students yep go for it but but personally i feel that that kind of foundational skill um is 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 sort of the most important you know that that curiosity that's gonna be that motivation um okay Emily, we're going to look to you for this one. So the, the question says, or asks, why do you think quantum concepts and vocabulary get co-opted in popular culture? I've seen the creator. I don't think it was co-opted. I think that's perfectly plausible. Uh, do you have advice for engaging in productive conversations, uh, sort of about misleading concepts or terminology that's perhaps twisted a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think that the concepts and and like uh, vocabulary around quantum gets co-opted in popular culture because it's awesome uh, <laughs> they're just cool words yeah. um, I mean like there's a lot of I think there's also this sort of tendency to use jargon as a way to sound intelligent or as a way to sound um, nerdy or or um, you know trying to make some sort of uh, uh, statement about yourself or your identity and so like I don't know, I think the perfect example of this is like the Big Bang Theory, right? Where it's like they they put these sort of nerdy concepts on, di on display to show like, oh yeah, look how nerdy these people are. And this is sort of, you know, sort of signaling that they are super smart people. But, um, you know, really, I think that's a missed opportunity if people don't actually understand the concepts that are being thrown out there to, you know, show some sort of super intelligence or whatever. Um, in terms of like, I don't know if correcting is the right word, but just sort of, uh, I see it as like, as a big opportunity because it means people are already engaged and interested. They're curious. They, they want to use the term. And I don't think you need to uh, correct them in terms of like a well actually or something like that. But using that as an opening to say like, oh, like, let's tell you more about quantum. Let's, let's talk more about basic science. Let's talk more about this really cool topic in physics. Um, you know, kind of using that as an opener or as a, as an opportunity to, to, to jump in there with, with maybe more fact-based information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. To me, I see it as kind of, you know, that person is maybe, or that, you know, maybe they're actually, they're already just primed, right. They're ready to hear about it. And so you can just kind of mm -hmm. jump in there and say, cool, like, let's talk about it more. And let's talk about like the, the science that's happening and make it really grounded in 
in the reality. It's, okay. not, it's a good so you, opportunity. So you see it as an entry point. I do. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's an open door and it's an invitation. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, we were um, we were fortunate a few weeks ago. We got to spend a little bit of time uh, in Toronto. We got to spend a little bit of time with some people that write policy and think hard about the the future legislatively. Um, I think about those folks, and maybe we flip it and and flip the orientation of the question to say, how should policymakers, particularly the ones that are earlier in career, how should they be engaging with the science community, science educators, science communicators. How, what what advice would you have, sort of in the other direction? Yeah, I mean, I think showing that curiosity. I think that you know what Damien was even talking about about just, uh, you know, just engaging in that that sort of curious thinking, that that wanting to know more, um, getting a feel for. Uh, you know, what people are doing, I think, especially in policy and in government, it's all about people, like it's really people focused. So um, taking if you have, you know, if you have time in your very, very busy schedule, taking time to visit a research institute or a university, um, meet a scientist, uh, you don't have to talk to them necessarily about, you know, their specific niche area of research, but just kind of getting a flavor for, you know, who, who is, who's there doing the work. Um, you know, who is in your in your constituency or like um, under your funding portfolio? Um, who, who are these people? What are they doing? What what really does that work look like? Yeah. I think a lot of people are surprised when they come in the doors at perimeter. They yeah. expect it to just be sort of like stuffy cubicles or offices where, uh, you know, people are, uh, you know, lone geniuses are kind of, you know, working away on a problem where it's this massively collaborative atmosphere people are students and and uh you know young people senior researchers are all like scribbling away on blackboards chatting with each other there's no labs like just getting a feel for what that work looks like um i think you know so that you, when you are reviewing policy to do with science and scientists that um you know it's not in a vacuum there's some understanding of what that work looks like who those people are what it is they're doing what they're passionate about um putting a sort of uh like a face to a name almost yeah we had we certainly had a gentleman who um expounded on that and said you know he'd done his best to do his reading ahead of time and found the language quite sort of challenging and um just in a few minutes in chatting with a few of us he he got so much more context out of that so i think that's i think that's great advice we're we're getting to the point where we've got to to wrap up uh before we go to wrap up any any kind of thoughts on that question about as we think about our our policy making friends any any guidance or advice you'd give them damien i just really i think you made a great point and i just echo that with with my bias and sweet spot of of just a similar thing getting out to schools talking to some teachers um seeing just what things are out like in the wild so to speak um because then i think just you know like going to perimeter or somewhere else you'd people would just would would just learn a lot um and there's a lot of expertise you know of of teachers and in the education system and really kind of tapping into that and sort of best practice effective practices and really again whatever the policy is it's it's hopefully evidence-based policy um but i think yeah you're going to learn a lot um, by being out there in sort of the real world, out there in the education system, interacting with people in it. Um, and so to me, that's that super valuable because I think there personally, there's a whole lot of amazing, great things being done that perhaps may benefit from some some new kind of policy kind of kind of supporting them. Okay. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, we've been around the horn, but we do have an opportunity for concluding remarks from um from each of you so uh emily maybe we could start with you closing thoughts concluding ideas wherever you want to go yeah i just had one extra thought as you were talking that i realized um oh i think i don't think we've covered it explicitly in this session and i think it's worth saying as we talk about science communication i think that sometimes there is a um i think a misconception that uh that scientists or people who work in science don't want to communicate or are busy or are 
so head in the clouds or, um, you know, are so focused on their research that uh, they are not interested in communicating their science more broadly. Whereas I have found this to be exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Every single scientist is like, please let me tell you about my science. Mm -hmm. Like they're dying to tell people about their science. You know, people working adjacent to scientists who are in science communication or in institutes like Permitter are also very eager to tell anyone and everyone mm -hmm. about what we're doing and about science. So I think maybe something that I would wanna leave the audience with um, is, you know, if you've been hesitating in reaching out about to learn about certain t science topics or have been, um, you know, a little bit wary of, of reaching out on those types of things, like I guarantee that the people who work in those areas are eager to talk mm -hmm. about science and eager to find a way to communicate it that resonates with you and that meets you where you are and that, you know, hopefully teaches you something new. Um, scientists are i think naturally curious people you know people us who work in science communication around scientists like it's it's our passion it's something that we find deeply exciting and um so i think that if there's a perceived barrier in reaching out and like and accessing science communication uh i think that that's maybe misguided it's it's you know i think that the, the willingness is certainly there in the community um, and I think that, uh, you know, maybe sometimes scientists aren't always sure where to go to communicate, but they're certainly eager to do so. So if you're interested in learning more about quantum or about, you know, cosmology or uh, string theory, even, you know, th there are scientists out there willing to talk about it and, you know, people out there willing to help with that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Maybe uh, one minute from you, Damien, if you want to wrap up. Yeah, I would say often science kind of gets, and technology get put in this box on the edge of society or something. And people think, well, only scientists, only, you know, nerds needs to worry about them. But I would say because we live in such a technological age and technology permeates um, everything that we do, I'd say kind of science is 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 everywhere. So it's um, an issue for all of society. And with quantum technologies, maybe you say, I don't care about them, but many of them, for example, are in the field of medical and health. And they are, I think, things that people care about. So I would say, um, you know, take science out of the box. It's sort of for, for everyone. It affects everyone. And also the point is that a lot of this science, where does the money come from? It's public money. It's, you know, if you're talking to the public, it's taxpayer money. It's sort of your money, right. so to speak. Right. So right. it's sort of very relevant from that point of view. So I just say science is everywhere and not in a box. All right. Excellent. Uh, the discussion today I thought was outstanding. So. Thank you very much to you both. Uh, prepara preparation was excellent and uh, really engaging. To the audience that that tuned in, uh, thank you very much for spending some time with us. It's a Friday. It's over the lunch hour. We really, <laughs> really appreciate it to our hosts at, at CSPC. Uh, excellent job on the support in the lead up. Uh, would encourage anybody to tune in to check the website if you're looking for more content like this. And uh, for those of you planning to come to Ottawa in, in 10 days, We'd uh, hope to see you there. So thanks very much. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in.